Field will roll through turns three and four as they come through this end of the racetrack. The pace car will head in for cover. Outside lane is your pole winner. That is Justin Bonsignor with the young Jake Johnson to the inside in old blue. The starter eyes him down and the green flag is out for the icebreaker 150. Down to the bottom of turn number one. Jake Johnson guards the inside lane. Here comes Bonsignor like a rocket down the back straightaway. Justin Bonsignor moves into position number one. With less than five-eighths of a mile, they come thundering back to the line. Lap number one will belong to Justin Bonsignor. He said earlier today that he wants to redeem himself from that missed Trouble! Chip. We've got a situation, three cars, four cars, hit at a ton down in turn number one. Among the cars that are involved, the 36 machine we see of Dave Zapienza, the 44 car, the Tineo car of Bobby Santos, and the number 58 of Eric Goodale, and it looks like the number two car of J.R. Batuccio. They're going to go ahead and throw the red flag out here along the uh, start-finish line. The safety crew is headed down into turn number one. You see Dave Zapienza collected here in turn one. Eric Goodale involved as well. Take another look at it. It happened toward the back of the pack. It was actually Bobby Santos. Looked like maybe a right rear tire went down on the 44 of Santos, and everybody piled in with just nowhere to go around the outside. Certainly is. That car did a 360, and you're right. It did appear that a tire went down. Heartbreaker for Santos. Uh, he drove a different car at Richmond. You remember that situation there, back behind the wheel of the Tineo car, and uh, there is the driver. We talked about it before of the Supreme race team, and they've just had no luck at all, Joe, whatsoever. No, none whatsoever, and the same could be said for Dave Sapienza. The same could be said for Eric Goodale. This is the third time in as many races that he has had this year and has ended up in an incident. So a tough way to start this Icebreaker 150. There is Eric Goodale dejectedly walking around the right side of his number 58. Well, Eric Goodale, as we've talked about so many times, he is a closer in the racing, did not get off to a good start. You can see how dejected he is. He throws the harness back into the race car. Our tough break for the GAF Riverhead Building Supply number 58. This guy likes to be consistent and smooth. Early in the race, the last 20 laps is when he puts on his A game. The Kraus family, of course, they run a facility in New Jersey, better known as the Wall Stadium, and they can't seem to find any luck or the horseshoe at all as uh, he takes that long, dejected walk back down to the center of the infield. There is Bobby Santos in the curb fire suit heading back to the infield care center to be checked up there. Heartbreaker for him. Very talented, versatile driver. And, uh, of course, the number 44 car has uh, just not got off to a very good start this season whatsoever. Let's take another look at what happened in turn one. Keep an eye on the black car on the inside lane. It's Bobby Santos as they went down into the turn. There was a bit of contact on the straightaway to the right side of Bobby Santos's tire and the left front of Andrew Krause. Soon after that, the right rear tire went down, skated across the racetrack, and multiple cars up there in the outside lane. The preferred lane here at Thompson really had nowhere to go. No, absolutely not at all. Matt Swanson dove to the inside. We'll see if we can get another look at that situation here. And uh, as things stacked up in the upper lane, it was uh, a heartbreaker. And there is Krause taking that long, dejected walk down, uh, down on Pitt Road. Joe, it's hard to believe that uh, before we get even settled in at the start of this event, that we would be under a red flag situation. Brian Vance and, of course, Jimmy Wilson in charge. And uh, there is two of the drivers that were involved in the situation discussing uh, what happened and what occurred there as well. So uh, not off to a very, very good start. However, Joe, we saw, even though we only had one lap into the record books, we saw how strong that Jake Johnson was on the start. But the car that is prepared by Ryan Stone, the number 51 car, the Phoenix machine, we saw how strong that car was getting in what we called in the old days forward bite. He came off that turn, stepped on the gas, and it launched. 
And that is just a sample of what we're going to see for the rest of the 149. We alluded to it earlier. Justin Bonsignor today has a lot of history on the line. Right now he is tied for second with Ted Christopher on the all-time win list. The Wheel of Modified Tour here at Thompson. One victory more. He'll have 14. The man who leads that, the late Mike Stefanik. He's got That's 15 correct. victories here at Thompson. The other thing that Bonsignor is going for here today is an opportunity to tie Ted Christopher for the all-time win list in the third, uh, fourth position. Uh, a couple s- uh, spots back, it'll be his 42nd career victory if Justin Bonsignor can get it done. And you look at the career that he has had. He's had a lot of success at tracks like Riverhead. But here at Thompson, this is where he's made his name. This is where those championships were won. Justin Bonsignor has this racetrack figured out. He certainly has. And, of course, you have to give credit to Ryan Stone. There was a time at this racetrack before Ryan Stone was known as the top crew chief he competed in what we called here the limited sportsman division he had a title run at a championship at this racetrack he moved down south he worked for southern cup teams before coming back up north and he found an impressive opportunity here let's hear more on the story in this most recent incident let's go down to pit road and jesse punch Eric Goodale and Tyler Ripkema, two of the drivers involved in that incident there on lap one, both okay, but very frustrated. Nothing they could have done about it, just victim of circumstance. But when you get in an issue like that on lap one here at Thompson, definitely walking away disappointed. Well, you can understand the disappointment, Joe, because uh, they didn't get off to a very good start, uh, less than five-eighths of a mile. There is, you know, we were just talking about Teddy Christopher. There is the Dave Zapienza number 36 car. Now, there's a lot of history. You all know the story that Dave Zapienza was a drag racer. Most people start to be a modified driver at a young age. He never even went to an oval track race, even though he had a very successful business in Riverhead. Then he decided to buy an oval track car and compete at Riverhead and went on to the Wheel and Modified Tour. And he's done quite well. This car is a tribute car to not only Teddy Christopher, the gentleman with those unbelievable stats you talked about a few minutes ago, but it is a credit to Eddie Whelan, who owned Teddy Christopher's Whelan Modified Tour Championship car. That's why it's the red number 36. And the car they ran yesterday even said Teddy Christopher on the roof. 2008, the only time Ted Christopher was able to secure a championship. His last victory driving came at this racetrack. Yes, and it, it was did. in what they called the SK Sunoco Modifieds here at Thompson Speedway Correct. Motorsports Park. It was a black and red number 79 that he won here. That was the final race he ever won in his storied modified career. Certainly was. And, of course, you have to remember he won a national title at this racetrack, too. We talk about the history of this grand race facility. It's had so many different names over the years. It was Thompson Speedway. It was the Big T. It was Thompson International Speedway. And now we know the current name of that. Over the years, John Honig, we know the story how it started out as part of a farm. The neighbor's farm was a real veteran who enjoyed and loved road course racing. The two farmers got together and they built part of what we see here today. That torch was handed forward from John Honig to Don Honig, a professional golfer, one of the best in the country, by the way, at that time, played with all the big names in golf. Donald then handed the torch over to his son, DR, and his grandson, Jonathan. They put together the road course as we know it today, and of course, the oval, and one of the most competitive, exciting proving grounds here on the East Coast. You know, there was a time everyone said Connecticut is the state of modified racing. We have great facilities like Thompson. We have facilities like Stafford. We have the short tracks like Waterford. We had a nice blend. Well, that blend was all founded right here on this 5 8 mile. Now, you've had a major part of this particular racetrack and this event. 50 years running for the icebreaker here at Thompson Speedway Motorsports Park. You were even creative enough to generate the logo for this event that was used now today. You see it it there atop the trophy. You drew that, and where did you draw it? Yeah, it was... (laughs) 
I set at my kitchen table. I was just 15 years of age. I drew it, and I brought it to a man who was also a major part of the success story, Wild Bill Slater. Bill Slater says, I'm going to bring that to Don Honig and show him that, and he's going to like that. I said, Mr. Honig will like something that a kid drew on the kitchen table. From that day to this day, the symbol of the icebreaker event was inspired by Don Honig to carry it forward from a kid in a trailer park at a kitchen table with a bunch of crayons and markers. Pretty true and pretty unique story. A promoter, an announcer, and an illustrator, a big part of what has happened here at Thompson Speedway Motorsports Park in the iconic Icebreaker logo, drawn first by Ben Dodge himself. The field has gotten the caution flag once again here. Everybody's rolling. J.R. Bertuccio will take a moment uh, to go down pit lane. If you're just joining us here, we're just a lap or so in, three laps in fact. The caution came out going down into turn number one just after they completed the opening lap, collected four cars and including Bobby Santos, Dave Sapienza, Andrew Krause, and Eric Goodale. Let's hear more on the incident. Let's go back down to pit road and Jesse Punch. Here with Dave Sapienza, one of the drivers involved in that incident there on lap one. Dave, what happened from your perspective? That was only lap one, huh? I didn't even think we made a lap. I don't know. Shit just happened in front of me. I just uh, tried to avoid it, but we just everybody got pushed to the top. Somebody got into the back of the 44 or 44 spun and just he took us all out. I mean, it probably wasn't his fault, but it just wrecked a lot of race cars. It's disappointing. Thanks, Dave. Bye-bye. The thoughts of Dave Zapienza down there on the pit lane. Now, Ben, this race is a pretty interesting event because there is so much on the line here. For many, many years, this race was the first race of the Wheel of Modified Tour schedule. But now that's changed a little bit, and the teams have had an opportunity to knock the rust off that's at New Severna and Richmond. But this race continues to be the start of the New England racing season. It certainly is, and it all began here. Don Honig's theory, he was a professional golfer, and he said... If you get a brand new pair of golf shoes, you want to get out on the golf course first, the first chance that the weather breaks. He used that theory with this racetrack and said, we want to get modified racing here at Thompson where it somewhat originated and we want to do it first. So that theory from golfing to racing kind of paid off and it's still being done. Here today. Certainly only about, uh, I'd say, 300 yards from the start-finish line to our backs here in the tower is one of the golf course holes here at Thompson Speedway, and that's been a big part of this particular facility. The field has been given the one-to-go signal. They all double up here along the front straightaway. Justin Bonsignor is the race leader, and Jake Johnson sitting there in the second position. We take a look at Austin Beers in the 64 car. He had that motor that they had to change after a practice incident. Now, because of the crash on the track, he started last, but he's been able to pick up several spots. He's already up to 16th. So, you know, good for some in an incident like this, but certainly bad for those involved. Certainly has. There was another side story. They had the motor to put in the car, but they needed a radiator. They had to drive all the way back to their shop in New London, get that radiator. Ronnie Uhouse got it back just in the neck of time. Here they come, Joe, off turn number four. Silent but deadly as they're about to fire them back out. Justin Bonsignor, that preferred outside lane for the start, darts back down into turn number one. A little bit cleaner this time than it was the first time around, and Bonsignor is freeing away with the race lead. Outside groove, though. Look at Craig Lutz in that 46. Launch off turn two. Just as impressive as Lutz is, here comes Patrick Emberling. Emberling moves alongside Ronnie Silk with the number one car. Back down into turn number one. Three cars, four cars run single file. They work their magic side-by-side battle. It looks like Matty Swanson is trying to work the inside, but that hasn't come in as yet as they rumble back to the line. That's Swanson, the only car running the bottom groove of the racetrack through turns three and four. The 22 of Kyle Bonsignor got loose off the corner. He was able to keep the car underneath him, and Swanson continues to run the bottom groove of the racetrack. Good battle there. There is the 56 car, the young 17-year-old Trevor Catalano. Two starts in his wheel and modified tour career. Two top five finishes. He's been impressive. Certainly has. And there, keep your eyes on the 64 car. You're looking directly at it as it heads down the front straightaway. Already the 64 of Austin Beers is into the top 13. 
He moves to the inside of Brian Roby down the back straightaway. He'll pick up another spot just off camera behind this battle here as we watch. Here comes the 60 car of Matt Hirschman. Up front, though, the battle continues to rage on. The 89 of Swanson, he'll have to settle back in line behind Tyler Ripkema. Now the battle for the race lead is Justin Bontenure in the 51 and Craig Lutz in the 46. Now Craig Lutz, he has gotten a, a brand new perspective on life. He left the 82 team when Danny Watts retired at the end of last season and boy this 46 team looks very strong in two races. They certainly do. You know they say in racing if you have a marriage and it breaks up in divorce it's hard to put the pieces back together. That is not the case with Lutz. Once he sat back behind the wheel of that car, and now look at him move to the bottom of the racetrack. Bonsignor on the high side, Lutz on the inside, evenly matched. Bonsignor with a little more giddy up off the turn, but you know the story here. If you can take it in deep, you can make the move. Now we've got a crossover. That's what makes racing at Thompson so great, the way you sweep up in the center of the corner, that the crossover move is common, but... Justin Bonsignor was not able to make it work. Bonsignor, I thought, was just going to let Craig Lutz just go right on by over there in turn three. Lutz has shown that he wants to get out in front. He wants to set the pace here today, and he's already got two victories at this racetrack. It's no surprise to see him up front. Certainly is. And once he has got into the lead, the margin between first and second is .247. That is how quick they are running. Top three cars make it four. Single file, about the same margin between first and second, second and third, and third and fourth. In the fifth spot is car number one. That, of course, is the house car for Robbie Fuller with Patrick Emberling. They were pretty, well, pretty on point when they said they have a car that will go for the long runs. And they didn't want to start up front. They wanted to start in the middle and let the race come to them. And that's what they did. They started exactly where they wanted to here today in the eighth position. Allow that long run speed to come in. And that's going to be one of the keys to the race today as Trevor Catalano in the 56 making the move to the inside of the 22 of Kyle Bontenor. This is a battle for the sixth position down at the bottom of turn three. But when you look at Patrick Everling, Eric Burt drove this race car on two occasions last year and was very, very fast. He had one of the fastest cars on track, but they didn't execute the race very well. Optimism is high with that one team of Patrick It Kevlin. certainly is. They literally will tell you they failed on pit road with Eric Burns, but today, new day and a new deal. Here is a good battle that is going on, but we've got a caution. Caution comes out. Second caution of the event. Car number four, Tim Conley's car, slows in the back stretch. This team, you know the story that Tim Conley drove and was extremely successful for the legendary Bob Garbarino. They had a lot of success at this particular racetrack. Professional football player, he decided he was going to go back to his family and his business and didn't race for quite a while. His wife decided to buy him the ultimate gift, the former Bob Garbarino number four. This is not the race car. This is a brand new one. He went to New Smyrna. He said they had a lot to learn, but they got strong. At Richmond, they too had a mechanical problem with the engines. The motors in these tour cars are not easy to get, Joe. You know that. Okay? So they had a problem finding and purchasing a motor because they wanted to run here. His wife told the story of how great and how nice modified people are to welcoming back a veteran like her husband, Tim Conley. Nine-time winner in the series. Last raced here in the year 2000 and has a victory here at Thompson, but it's been 24 years since he raced here at this track, Ben, and a lot has changed, certainly, including the pavement has changed yes. because it was paved since the last time Tim Conley has it raced It certainly here. was. You know, yesterday we were talking about a story about this racetrack. The very first driver to ever go on the last paving of this oval at Thompson Speedway was the legendary Tommy Baldwin. We selected and went through the record books, and we decided that Tom Baldwin would be the first candidate. He came here, and he was the first modified to literally caress the pavement here at the 5 8 mile oval. If you look in the turns at this racetrack, you'll see a patch of asphalt that appears to be a completely different color, Joe. The reason for that is in the original paving, it did not, well, adhese or settle in. So they had to make a readjustment. That readjustment created a really fast racetrack, one that all the competitors, especially Ted Christopher, 
really liked here at Thompson. Work continues off the end of the back straightaway to remove the Tim Conley car as they try to jack that car up at the rear. J.R. Bertuccio, the two car, is being shown the lucky dog. And pit road has opened some strategy play. The driver that was running inside the top six was Kyle Bonsignor. He's going to come down pit road for some service here on this pit stop. A few others at the tail end of the field will come in as well. This is a very interesting strategy decision by Cam McDermott to come in. Now, notice that they're putting fuel inside this race car. They will tell you with the gear change rule that they made that these cars will go just about 140 yes, laps on exactly. fuel. Now, we had a couple extra pace laps to get some heat in the tires because of the cool temperatures here at Thompson. They ran some pace laps or some caution laps already here today, but just a little extra splash of gas for Cam McDermott and Kyle Bonsignor on that team. You know, you talk about history in this racetrack. Cam McDermott is a former champion of what they call the Thompson Modifieds here. He also came back and won in the SK Lights. Him, his dad, and his mom, he started and raced at the quarter midget track. They live right over the hill in Rhode Island here, and what an impressive. Started out as Woody Pitcat, spotter, went on to be the crew chief of both Woody and for this team, and he is highly respected as one of the best in the business. Cam McDermott, crew chief on that 22 car, said earlier today, he said, you know, it's a little bit unique when you run this race at Thompson. Traditionally, the icebreaker in the World Series, which is run here in October, are two-day events. Yes. You practice and qualify on Saturday. You go onto the racetrack cold when it comes to Sunday afternoon's competition. But it's been a little bit different here today because today it was an abbreviated schedule. Everything was planned for the same day. We qualified only about 45 minutes before the green flag. Cam McDermott there on the left of your frame down on the pit lane, the crew chief of the 22 car for Kyle Bonsignor. Um, but, you know, that changes it because yesterday the track was washed away. Completely Rain was here, different. green racetrack. Yesterday afternoon, the Monaco Ford Tri-Track Series was about ready to take green. It missed it on and off. The only corner of the state of Connecticut that had any form of rain was right here. There is a side note. Also, the competitors for the Wheel and Modified Tour, not only were they a part of a one-day event today, however, they were not even allowed on the property in the garage area because that garage area was being used by the Monaco Tri-Track Series. So there was a whole different flavor to coming here, racing here, and getting the job done all in one day. Catalano looks to return to the competition. We're under the second caution here in the Icebreaker 150 for the Wheel and Modified Tour. 23 laps in, and Craig Lutz is out in front. Getting ready for the restart here at Thompson. The pace car is in as they roll up off turn of her floor. The green flag is back out here at Thompson as they rumble onto the main straightaway. There's no question about it. Almost like he gave the leader of the pack lots of power assist. It is Ronnie Silk, high, wide, and handsome down the back straightaway. Silk moves into the second spot, side-by-side -side racing Joe for the third position. Here comes Jake Johnson, car number three. Johnson working the outside lane while Ron Silk takes a peek on Craig Lutz into turn number one. Can't make it work, though, and the battle is on for third. Justin Bonsignor to the bottom. Jake Johnson stuck at the top groove. Jake Johnson continues to ride high. He moves back into the third spot. Here comes the young Catalano, Trevor Catalano. Trouble now. Off the turn, Swanson. The 56, just as we said it, all of a sudden drops off the pace. Header pipe smoking for that 56 car of Trevor Catalano. And what a tough day it has been for the Catalano family. They had a car that crashed in practice, and now the caution flag is out. Undoubtedly for the 56 of Trevor Catalano continues to smoke down the back straightaway. 
What a tough break for this Catalano family. Unbelievable. A crash in practice, and now what appears to be an engine expiring on this 56. And the worst part of the heartbreaker of all of this, every single time their cars are quick, they're fast, and they're running up front in the competition. So uh, what a heartbreaker. You know, we're looking at timing and scoring, Joe, and we're seeing that Austin Beers has moved into the top 10, currently in the 8th spot with the number 64. Matt Hirschman is one spot ahead of him in 7th. Let's take another look at it here. You see a bit of contact between the 56 and Justin Bonsignor, and right after that you see the smoke coming out the right bank of that header pipe for the 56 of Trevor Catalano. He has now brought that car back behind pit wall, his day apparently done for the young 17-year-old driver. You know, there's an old saying, they say just before an engine lets go, it goes its best, and we saw that car really running strong and at its best heartbreaker for that young talented driver as he was running up front in the competition here hopefully we'll have an opportunity to hear from him with the success that he's had over the first couple of races this season i mean modified racing is certainly uh, got a lot of different forms here especially over the past couple of years uh, but to see new drivers come in to any series let alone the wheel and modified tour and finish Two races inside the top five, a third-place effort at New Smyrna, a, uh, a third-place effort last time out at Richmond, a fifth-place effort at New Smyrna. Really impressive drive for the young Trevor Catalano. It certainly is. The entire family, as we said, they literally showed up at New Smyrna with seven race cars competing in the Wheel and Modified Tour and all the other divisions as well. So uh, they are serious racers, and uh, they were able to put together some strong runs in the first three races. You know, when we talked to people in the garage area, the crew chiefs, the drivers, they all said one thing. We need a good, solid, long run under green in this race. We haven't seen that during the first 30 laps, Joe. We have been plagued with cautions for minor situations, and we've also seen some teams pit earlier than we ever anticipated. Yeah, this race looks a little bit different than we thought. It certainly looks very different for Trevor Catalano. Let's hear from him on his woes here today. Engine troubles for Trevor Catalano ends his Wheel and Modified Tour debut here at Thompson. A tad early. You had such a strong start to this season. How disappointing is this run today? Yeah, you know, it's really disappointing. Uh, we were working our way through. We were up to fifth, and the car was actually really good. You know, uh, we didn't really expect to be that good there. We figured we'd drop back a little bit, just ride and try and save our tire. But, uh, you know, we were working our way forward, just trying to stay out of trouble. And, uh, you know, uh, coming out of four there, just uh, shut off on us. So, uh it sucks, but uh, we'll regroup and uh, hopefully be back from an Anak. You told me pre-race that you were using this run to learn as much as you can about this place, Thompson Speedway. Did you able? Were you able to learn anything in those first twenty-some laps? Yeah, you know, uh, we worked a lot on trying to figure out how to pass and uh, slide jobs and uh, whatever else happens here, you know. And uh, I think we figured it out a little bit, you know. And we got a good notebook to come back at for the uh, following races here, and uh, hopefully we'll have a better run. Thanks, Trevor. You're welcome. Lots of Trevor Catalano, tough, tough break for him. It in that sure team. is. It really is. You know, for the fans that are watching on Flow, they just talked about a slide job. And I think here at Thompson, this is one of the racetracks that is patent pending for a slide job. Joe, let's explain it to the listeners at home. This racetrack has the ability to go from the outside lane down to the bottom lane very, very quickly, and it creates those crossover moves. But sometimes to be able to complete a pass, if you go into the turn, you've got a dive bomb early on the bottom, come across and sweep across the nose of the car that you're trying to pass, and that sometimes creates that slide job. It certainly does, and sometimes just enough finesse to bog the car down can make all the difference. Right now, we've re-racked the field. The wheel and modified tour is under green to the bottom of turn number one. Ronnie Silk put the car to the bottom, car number 16. But here on the outside, Bonsignor is back on the roll. And here comes Jake Johnson, car number three. Jake Johnson goes to the outside of Ronnie Silk, but Silk walked up the racetrack. And Johnson now going to lose a couple of positions. Here comes Patrick Emerling rallying down to the bottom. In a bit for the fourth spot as Emerling trying to move inside the top four for the first time today. But that outside lane, so much momentum here at Thompson when you can roll the top. Certainly was. And right there in that front pack of cars, it is car number 64, Austin Beers. 
With 35 laps in this race, he has passed more cars than anyone else in the field. Beers is now in the top five, and he isn't done yet. Might be a backup motor, but I'm going to tell you, it's a supreme engine because it's getting the job done. The drama from one week ago between the three car of Jake Johnson and the 64 of Austin Beers. Those two came together early, Johnson getting into Austin Beers, and it ended Austin Beers' day just 13 laps in. He said, I'm going to name this 64 car the Avenger, and he has had no good luck here today, and he is certainly avenging what has been a tough race at Richmond and a tough race so far here today. Brand new engine, never saw the racetrack today, and now he's inside the top five after starting last. He certainly is, and as we said before, he is closing up the gap on Jake Johnson again. A few minutes ago, we saw Patrick Emmerling contending among the top four. He has dropped back down in the field to the seventh position. Another individual we got to give a shout out to is the number 89 car for Matt Swanson. Swanson doesn't run all the wheel and modified tour events. This is his own race car. Gary Casella and the crew from the 25 are all a part of that success story here today. Battle starting to heat up for the second spot. It's weird to say that for the second spot with Justin Bonsu and Ron Silk because they have been 1-2 all season long today. Craig Lutz trying to change that narrative, but it's Justin Bonsignor who is second, third for Ronnie Silk, and Silk continues to put the pressure on the three-time champ. Certainly does. You know, there's an old saying, you can run in the tire tracks of the car in front of you, and that is exactly what Ronnie Silk is doing behind Justin Bonsignor. Watch how he can reel him in, then off the turn and into the next turn, a whole different scenario. Further back in the field, we've got some more action happening. But right now, our attention is on second. Silk took a peek to the inside. Car number 16, but Bonsignor just shook him off as he continues to hold on to second. Silk searching for more speed, searching for more grip in turns three and four. Went to the bottom that time through, continues to look inside down the front straightaway, but will ride in the tire tracks of Justin Bonsignor in turns one and two. Now, Craig Lutz has not been able to drive away from these two, but the top three have certainly put a pretty big gap back to the three car of Jake Johnson. Now, deeper in the pack, the 60 car of Matt Hirschman. He restarted in seventh. He's lost a couple of spots. He's back to ninth. He's got his hands full with Anthony Cecily and Tyler Ripkema. There's no question. That race car, Matt Hirschman told me in the garage area, he said, I haven't really had enough time behind the wheel to get a true feel for it. It's a good race car, but, you know, it's not the cars that I have had success with here at Thompson. Over the years, Matt has been so close, he lost the title here at the Speedway several years back. And here comes Tyler to the inside with that number 32 car. Cecily on the outside as they rumble off the turn. And right there is Kyle Bonsignor. Now, he came down pit road for an adjustment and that splash of gas under that second caution in the 22 car. He makes this pass. He'll move back inside the top 10. So that's a big strategy play for the 22 of Kyle Bonsignor and thinks that he doesn't have to worry about fuel at the end of this race. He's now inside the top 10. You know, there's a margin between first and second on the last circuit by of .491. So in reality, it's not an illusion. It appears that our leader, Lutz, is starting to pull away just a bit. Here comes Silk now, making a move off turn number four, gets the bite, but it is Bonsignor who seems to just point that car, and it sticks, and it goes. He's able to hold Ron Silk at bay. Off turn number two, Silk continuing to work the inside groove of the racetrack, find a little bit lower, and on both ends of the racetrack, he is about half a lane lower than what Justin Bonsignor has been able to run, and Bonsignor is pretty content to run the high groove. That's the preferred uh, groove here at Thompson Speedway as they run high through the center of the corner and then use that to carry that momentum down the straightaway. They certainly do, and this has been the longest run under green at this point in the event so far. We are on lap number 48, just shy of lap 50 of this 150-lap event here on the historic 50th anniversary of the Icebreaker event. Here comes Silk again, down into turn number three. Plants it to the bottom, rips up the racetrack. That's the perfect definition of the slide. Second place is now being held by Ronnie Silk with car number 16. Nice job by Ron Silk to be able to 
Great position down to the bottom of turn three that last time through. Justin Bonsignor early on as we just hit the lap 50 mark, not going to contest that spot this early in the event. He'll settle back into third as Craig Lutz continues to open up the advantage. Now, we saw how long it took Ron Silk to find a way around Justin Bonsignor. You can see already he's already cut the distance between first and second in half. He's starting to track down Craig Lutz. He certainly is. He's getting settled in and developed a, a great rhythm here at this racetrack as he continues to close up the gap, and he's closing it up rather quickly on the leader, Craig Lutz. Lutz is still in command. The lap traffic just ahead of them looks like the two car of uh, J.R. Vitucio will be the next car that is about to go down the lap. There's the 64 car of Austin Beers into the top five, Joe, and that car is running on rails. Murphy's machine with Ronnie Uhau, Sly Saban, who is instrumental in providing the magic third generation driver his grandfather his dad all were great drivers and they all love thompson speedway his dad has a victory here eric beers who continues to work with this team both father and son along with about 10 other people were scrambling to get this motor replaced before the race ron Uhas actually had to go back to their shop and get a radiator they didn't have a spare one that they could make work here at the racetrack he had to go back there and get that replaced in time for the race today and now austin beers has settled in to the fifth position there's a long way to go and he used a lot of his race car driving from that 23rd starting position to where he is right now he's kind of in that ride mode right now waiting for the opportunity to come down pit road and get his time he certainly is joe and you can watch that Every so often the car develops a little bit of a twitch, but for the most part, it is standard. You could put a chalk line on the racetrack, and he would hit that line every circuit by. That, of course, is car 64 that you're looking at. And as we said before, last year at Richmond, they were the big dogs. Look at what was going on in the right corner of your screen as the work continued to remove that motor earlier today. And everybody, there is Austin Beers in the fire suit, right there in the thick of things, elbows up to Greece, and there he is. Now, dialed in and focused, here's another good battle going on, and it's the battle for the lead. Ron Silk, since he got by Justin Bonsignor, was slowly starting to reel in the race leader in the 46. That is Craig Lutz. Now, Silk took a look to the outside, inside, off turn number two. Now in the tire tracks, Lutz will protect the bottom. Here comes Silk with a crossover off turn four. He makes the move to the inside. It is Silk, lap traffic just ahead of them. Bottom of turn number one, Ronnie Silk becomes the next leader of the event. Lutz can't believe his eyes. With a blink of an eye, he drops back to second. Lap traffic, no problem here, but here comes Silk the third leader of the event. Ron Silk looking as good as he ever has here in the 2024 campaign. Last year so good winning that championship for the second time in his career. This year wins and New Smyrna. A photo finish at Richmond last weekend to finish in second and now powerfully 60 laps in takes the race lead and speaking of 60, how about Northampton, Pennsylvania's Matt Hirschman, that car continues to come to life. He's now into seventh with a pass over Matt Swanson. Rip King moves to the inside. He tries to make the move down to Lee Swanson. Swanson gets shuffled back a bit in the upper lane. Here comes the battle there. And right there with them in that battle is Kyle Bonsignor. You're right, Bonsignor did pit early. He's come back, and the adjustment in the Lewandowski sponsored race car has been the right adjustment. He's coming to the front. The other thing you can see is we talked about the green racetrack in the rain here yesterday in different divisions in this track that has sat cold all winter long here in the state of Connecticut in the Northeast in a winter that just does not want to release its grip. The racetrack is starting to rubber in. You see that Hoosier racing tire for the Wheel of Modified Tour is starting to mark the corners in both turns one and two and three and four and that will change the complexity and the handling of this racetrack as we go deeper into the night. The sun begins to settle in behind the clouds and the air temperature gets even cooler certainly does and cool air means a very quick race car of course that's in the engine compartment down to the bottom here comes again challenging but came on the high side as they come off the turn the 77 car is working excuse me the 22 car is working its magic down low to the inside tyler ripkeman that 32 car he's just hoping to have a clean day here he's had a rough start 
in a couple of races this season. Incident late in the going at Richmond off turn four, knocked the right front off their favorite race car, but they've got this 32 car wound up and looking pretty good in the eighth position here today. They certainly want more, but most of all, they want to have a race car that finishes solidly inside the top five or ten and one that they can roll inside the box. At the that end is the so true, and it's a family operation. This is a group that works hard, and they race together as an entire family. Here, moving to the inside again to try it. Kyle Bonsignor, the door gets shut. He has to settle back in behind Ripkema as they come down again. Ripkema still guards the spot. Back up front, leader of the event. It is still Ron Silk, 67 of 150 laps into the record books here in the Icebreaker event in its 50th season here at Thompson. Car just in front of this battle that we watch here, Matt Hirschman, he was carving his way through the field not too long ago in the yellow number 60. He is now closed in on the back bumper of Patrick Emerling, and he is starting to make some ground up. The 60 of Hirschman rolling forward here, trying to make a move in the next couple of laps to see whether or not he can make something happen. Here's a good battle, though. The Justin Bonsignor machine, who is running third, starting to fall back. Jake Johnson is there. He'll look to the inside of the back straightaway. Jake Johnson dives to the inside, picks up the spot. You know, literally, in modified racing here at Thompson, the Bowler family owned the real estate more through the 70s, the 80s. Legendary drivers like Fred DeCero, Lenny Bowler, all set behind the wheel of these cars, and they all had success. This youngster inspired to run for this team as a youngster with a matchbox car on his bureau, and now he is wheeling this car to the search of a victory, setting back in the third position. Pit strategy hasn't come in as yet, Joe. Last year, Jake Johnson led 22 laps in the World Series. He finished second. You talked about pitch strategy. They lost about six spots, if not more, on pit lane. And that's really what cost him the opportunity to have that track position for the final run of the checkers. Jake Johnson, with the speed that he has shown this year, last week he had problems. We alluded to that earlier, but the problems that he had with Austin Beers put him at the back of the pack. And I think Jake Johnson was one of the biggest storylines and the biggest part of the show last week in Richmond. He absolutely was. There's no question about it. And in addition to that, you have to wonder, on the Monaco Tri track Series, Jake Johnson's crew chief is guess who? Ryan Stone. When it comes to the efforts and perhaps some of the knowledge that Stone has instilled in Jake Johnson, it has made a difference. We know that Jake Johnson is one of the magical ingredients in running this racetrack as a young up-and-comer here at the 5 8 Mile Speedway. Austin Beers will give up a couple of spots as Patrick Emerling and Matt Hirschman able to sneak on through as Beers' car is very, very quickly slowing off the pace. As a matter of fact, he's about ready to get gobbled up by the cars behind him. But the 60 car of Hirschman coming across the way. It's a lap past halfway here. Just 75 laps complete in the Icebreaker 150 for the Wheel and Modified Tour. The laps clicking off very quickly today. They certainly are. And keep your eyes on the number 60 car. Matt Hirschman working his way through traffic. Hirschman is setting back in the sixth spot. That's directly in front of the 64 car of Austin Beers. Now, directly in front of that car is Kyle Bonsignor. Now in seventh, Hirschman moved into the sixth spot. And now Hirschman is reeling in on Patrick Emerling. Look at the 60 car of Matt Hirschman. 26 times he has raced here in the Wheel and Modified Tour. Has not won at this racetrack in Wheel and Modified Tour competition. His car looking as good as ever. Remember the last time he raced here, he ended up breaking his wrist in an incident on the back straightaway. Really derailed his 2023 season. It certainly did. And if you go back in the record books, you'll discover that Hirschman was in a shot to win the title here at Thompson of the Wheel of Modified Tour. Finished second, and on that day, he not only lost the title, but he lost his ride as well. And this racetrack has been very good over the years to the Hirschman family. Sure his has. dad, Tony Hirschman, when they crowned the champion here at Thompson Speedway, this was where Tony Hirschman was able to capture many of those championships in his storied modified career. You know, it now appears that Austin Beers is starting to back up just a bit because we can see Tyler Ripkema moving in and getting closer and closer. Now that is the battle for the 8th, ninth position right there. You're looking at it as they're coming off the turn and 
Veers continues to try to hold off and shake off the number 32 car, but the 32 car is getting quicker. You take a look at where the race leader Ron Silk is in this battle that we watch on the frame. Ron Silk on the same straightaway now as he comes off turn number two. He leads the way at the moment over Craig Lutz and Jake Johnson, the top three, but they are starting to close in on some of these contenders that are inside the top ten in the running order. Ron Silk has that car running on rails. There you see the gap to Craig Lutz, Jake Johnson coming through, and there's Justin Bonsignor. You know, at currently he has the biggest margin between first and second 1.673 that we have seen in this event so far we are 82 laps up on the board of 150 you're looking at the leader car number 16 a car prepared by phil moran and of course ronnie silk came up through the ranks competing in the sks the sk lights drove quarter midgets ran at waterford as a youngster and he is a true champion and the guy to beat one of the outstanding competitors in this series. We were surprised by the early couple of cautions that we had three so far here today, but Ben, since lap 28, we've been under the green flag, and that has been the trend at Thompson over the past handful of races. Long runs in the first section of the race, but then somewhere around lap 100, there tends to be a caution that then sets up a lot of short sprints to the finish. So while these teams start thinking about if that caution were to come out, what adjustments they would make, they may need to set a race car up that has been running on this long 60-lap run to only run short sprints to the finish. I think you're exactly right with that because you've just seen Austin Beers literally settle back from running in the top five as Beers has dropped back even further in the field. There's another one of the Catalano cars to the inside as your leader. Silk goes to the outside, and Silk continues to be a driving force up front. See the Catalano number 54 has had a nice day today recovering from that incident. 11th right now. He just goes that lap down, but the oldest of the three Catalano brothers, boy, he has done a great job. When you talk to Trevor Catalano, who we saw that two top fives to start the season, at 26 years old, Tommy Catalano, his older brother, has that notebook that allows yes, him to prepare. We we mentioned 153 races today at Thompson Speedway Motorsports Park. That means some of these teams have a very tall notebook sitting back in the garage area. Many of these crew chiefs have been part of it for a long time, whether as a crew member or as a crew chief, going back to 1985 when the series began over 40 years ago. Tommy Catalano has built his notebook up, and he has now handed that off to his two younger brothers, Tyler and Trevor. As the caution flag is out, it's Matt Swanson off turn four. That and brings out caution number four. Interestingly enough, Joe, just as we were talking about it around lap number 100, we are shy at lap number 89 up on the board, and it was Matt Swanson with car number 89. Kind of a appropriate situation. Swanson was running in the 14th position, battling with Brian Roby in the 25 car, and Ken Heggie was directly behind him with the number 18 car. So 90 clicks off on the board. J.R. Batuccio's back down on pit road as we speak, and there we're looking at the front pack of cars, and it is Ron Silk, currently the leader of the event. Craig Lutz still setting in second. Jake Johnson is in third. Justin Bonsignor setting back in the fourth spot. Patrick Emberling dropped back to eighth with that one car and then worked his way back up into the top five. Hirschman is next and Kyle Bonsignor. Let's see what's going to happen on pit road. If you were a betting man, Joe Koss, would you bet the leaders come in or stay out with 91 circuits down of 150? I would take that bet any day of the week, and I would bet you that they are all going to come down pit road. Four tires is what they can take here today at Thompson Speedway. Now, the race has been on the track for the first 91 laps. The race will turn to pit road, and this is where this race has been decided the last couple of years. Absolutely. Getting out in front on this pit stop is ultra critical to your success in getting to victory. Lane. Well, you can see the rattling going on pit road as everybody is up on the wall. Competitors uh, in the cars are receiving information from the spotters. High atop race central. We're looking for pit road to open. It does. No surprises to me and Joe. Here comes Silk. With him comes Lutz. Jake Johnson. 
along with the 51, Patrick Everling, the one, and Matt Hirschman down Ron the pit road. Ronnie Silk will hit his pit stall. Jesse Punch. The field coming down pit road now, making their only stop of the day to get fresh tires. Ron Silk currently in the lead, hoping to remain in the lead here with a quick pit stop. In talking to these drivers before the race, they mentioned this is the difference maker. You can unload fast, but how you handle this pit stop and how you get back on the racetrack after this pit stop is going to be what could make or break it for you. There you see the 64 of Austin Beers also on his way, having a stellar day, having made his way up through the field, currently in second coming to this restart. You know, Jesse, just as you were talking about the importance of a pit stop, a team that failed with a pit stop a year ago has just got the blue ribbon on this one. Car number one, and that is Patrick Emmerling. They managed to get out first, kind of a surprise, but not really. Ronnie Silk was second car out, Jake Johnson was third, Justin Bonsignor, and then Austin Beers. The one car of Patrick Emmerling goes from fifth to first to take over the race lead for the first time today. I spoke with Patrick earlier today, and I said, what do you think about your pit crew given those challenges that they've had? He said, you know what? My 07 crew, when I ran my own car last year, was one of the best crews on pit road. We've combined the best from that team along with the best of the 79 team for yes. John McKennedy in that group, and we think we have the fastest crew on pit road. And I said, Patrick, I've never seen your car be first off of pit road. He said, I've never been close enough to the front. I've always been back 10th, 11th, 12th, and I've picked up a bunch of spots. But you watch today. We're going to win the race off pit road. He, he sure right. did. Robbie Fuller, this is what they call the LFR house car. Robbie Fuller told me the exact same story. He said, we are not going to get caught, pardon the expression, with our pants down on pit road again. We are going for this one, and we're going to get out there first. And they went for it. There is the crew down on pit road. The Fleet Works group getting it done here on pit road. You see those smiles. And they the know, high fives. They know what that meant here today. Puts that one car out in front. At the beginning of the broadcast, we talked about a couple of drivers. That would be drivers to watch. Patrick Emmerling was one. Jake Johnson was the other. And Emmerling now has got the track position do they have the car that can hold it out front for 55 more laps? You know, when we talk about the history of this event, 50th anniversary, see how the number 50 comes into play. When we go back to green, we are going to have 50 laps or a few more or shy of that. That is going to be the sprint. That's what racing was founded on at this racetrack. A simple 50-lap format in the old days today. Man and machine, 50 drooling laps, no time now to not step on the gas and to be in the winner's circle. Last week, Patrick Emmerling made a mistake on pit road with a commitment code violation. It cost him an opportunity after being up in front of the pack following the pit stop, just like he is right now. He will choose the outside lane over Ron Silk, who's on the bottom. The pace car lights will come back on, and we will wave the restart off. Let's talk a little bit more about Patrick Emmerling. Racing has changed. He drives for the house car. You talked yes. about it. Robbie Fuller and that team, they've got a, a system that they call the pull-down machine. That's correct. That they have at their shop. They input the data that mimics and mirrors what Thompson Speedway is, and you put the car on this machine that captures all the all data the movements. and all the Absolutely. movement of the racetrack. They ran about 50 or 60 laps on the pull-down machine with this one car to prepare for the race today and we talked about them qualifying eighth and they said that's right where we want to be because they wanted long run speed those 50 60 lap runs and now they've got the opportunity to showcase they them. certainly did they came here with a mission robbie fuller said i want this one bad more than any other race i have a well a reason and a proof for me to be able to get the job done here they come they've re-racked the field off turn number four Outside is Emmerling. Inside, Ronnie Silk. Green is out in the racing to the bottom of turn one. Silk with a huge start on the bottom as he nosed out in front to the inside lane into the 26-degree banking. And Silk slides Patrick Emmerling up the racetrack to take the race lead. Here comes Jake Johnson to the bottom of turn three. Jake Johnson dives in deep. He slides up the racetrack. Backs out of it just a moment. Steps on the gas again. And now it is Jake Johnson back in the second. Here comes Bonsignor 
setting his sights high. Off the turn, no problems there. Eberling has to settle back in to the bottom of the top five. Back off turn number four. Leader still is Ronnie Silk, Jake Johnson. And here comes Bonsignor again. 99 lap show up on the board. Joe, when they come back to the stripe, exactly 50, and the clock will be ticking to wind out the icebreaker event. 50 years of history here at Thompson Speedway Motorsport Park. Lap 100 with 50 laps to go, and Ron Silk is back out in front. Jake Johnson, though, on the hunt. He finished second the last time we were here to Ronnie Silk, who leads right now. He is looking for his first career wheel and modified tour win. Four cars, nose to tail, bumper to bumper. They rumble off the turn. No one is stepping out of line this time. Bottom of turn number one, it is still Silk. Meanwhile, Jake Johnson trying to shake off Monsignor. A little further back, the number 19 car is uh, trying to hold off Swanson, who picks up a spot. Here comes Monsignor again, Joe. Will he be able to do it off turn four? Monsignor is there, down the end of the front straightaway, back into the banking of turns one and two, and Monsignor will set him up off turn two, pulls to the inside of the back straightaway. They come together. Monsignor rolls out of the throttle, and here comes Craig Lutz to the top. Craig Lutz is bold and daring to the upper lane, pulls it back into position. Lutz still in the four spot. Top four cars, single file. Meanwhile, the number one of Emerling is about two car lengths behind them. Here comes Bonsignor. Tests the waters again. Can't get the job done. And here comes Jake Johnson holding on as Silk is pulling away. Point two eight one between first and second. Silk just so strong now that he's got the race lead again. These tires do not give up on the grip category, so knowing it's only 45 laps to the finish, they are going all out, including Justin Bonsignor, who drives to the inside in turn four. Can't make it work. Johnson holds on to second. While that happens, that works to the advantage of Lutz with car number 46. He almost was able to align himself in the right position. Didn't happen. A few minutes ago, it was four cars contending for the lead. That has now changed. We've got seven, make it eight cars in single-file formation as the leader of the band still remains Ronnie Silk. Look at another car that's just outside of frame, the 22 car of Kyle Bonsignor as we continue to watch the battle here with Jake Johnson and the 51 of Justin Bonsignor. He's coming in to the picture as well. He runs sixth. He had uh, gotten off pit road deeper inside the top ten. He's starting to march forward in the 22. Certainly is. And uh, the 64 car of Austin Beers is now up to seventh. He's behind Bonsignor as we look further back in the field. Ripken is right there with them, but as they come off the turn, coming up on lap traffic, here is the leader. Silk is still there, and now it appears that the top three cars are starting to pull away. Meanwhile, Lutz has lost about two positions, and here comes Monsignor again. He looks to the top side this time, Joe. Thinks twice of it, goes from the outside to the end of in turn one. Trying to make a move work and find a lane around Jake Johnson. You've got a lot of places that you can run here at Thompson across this bottom groove all the way to the top. That time Bonsignor lost a ton of ground as his car slid the nose off turn two. He falls back into the clutches of the 46 of Craig Lutz who led this race early on. He certainly has and we see once again as they work their magic down into turn number one. Lutz now continues to try to close up that gap on Bonsignor. Remember, just two laps ago, Bonsignor was nipping at the back bumper of the Jake Johnson car. Now, all of a sudden, that has changed. And now it appears that Patrick Emerling is starting to settle in just a bit, too. Emerling, after getting shuffled out of the race lead on that restart, fell back to fifth, and he has not really shown much strength beyond that. He settled into the fifth spot, has not been able to close in to Craig Lutz and show what that car has at this point, but time running short, 112 laps now completed the 150 today. Kyle Bonsignor has moved into, with that 22 car, into the top six. He's on a roll. Rapima is there behind him, and then the number 64 of Austin Beers and Matt Swanson, who started out strong, was involved in an early spin. He's come right back to the top 10 cars. Down the back straightaway. Still, Silk is the leader. The Catalano machine 
Another one of their cars is limping back down on pit road. It's Tyler Catalano this time. He'll make it to pit lane, but the car well off the pace for the 84 car. All three of those Catalano brothers having a tough day here today at Thompson. You know, Jake Johnson, it's not often that somebody can say, I was able to hold Justin Bonsignor at bay at Thompson, and Jake Johnson has not given any ground away to Justin Bonsignor. Matter of fact, he continues to gain and drive away from Justin Bonsignor. Certainly has. Of course, Jake Johnson has a lot of laps on this racetrack in a full-body car. Now we're looking at the number 22 car of Kyle Bonsignor literally running in the tire tracks of the 32 car. And behind them, you can see it to the right or the left of your screen as they go down the front straightaway. It is Austin Beers. That's another good battle going on. 116 of 150. Leader of the pack is still Ronnie Silk in the Phil Moran prepared number 60. 64 of Austin Beers, never able to really find his legs here today, especially with that problem that they had in the motor in practice. Certainly a valiant effort for that team, but I think that they're going to be very disappointed with a run inside the top 10. He has not had the best of success here at Thompson. Four races in, he's got one top five, but this racetrack has certainly not been one that Austin Beers has been able to move the needle on. It certainly hasn't, and of course, he's a youngster, so he's still got plenty of time to figure out this situation. Leader coming up on lapped automobile, closing up the gap. Patrick Emmerling is moving in. As we look off turn number four, here's the 22 car, Kyle Bonsignor, and the 64. And now the rapid car being chased by the dogs is, of course, Ronnie Silk. The big dog that's trying to chase him down is the number three car of Jake Johnson. Jake Johnson was able to drive away from Justin Bonsignor. And he had closed within about five car lengths of Ron Silk, but now has lost that ground. Now eight, ten car lengths back to the race leader. There is a battle for the third spot. Justin Bonsignor still holding on. Craig Lutz is there and Patrick Everly in the one car. Riding in fifth. Puts pressure on Craig Lutz, but has not found a way around it. Certainly has it. There are times. He'll come off that second turn. That's what you're looking at right now. He dives to turn number three. Goes up the hill. Crosses over this time. Can't put it in. The inside groove has to think twice of it and pulls back in the line. This time, as we look at it, he'll try a different strategy, Joe. He'll look to the bottom. Pull it back in the formation. Tries it again to go high. It just doesn't work. You can see the flame coming out the right side of that one car. Patrick Emerling waiting very, very long off the throttle. That's when the flame comes out. And now he gets sideways out of turn one. Collected is Tyler Ripkema. Somehow Patrick Emerling is able to rope it back in. And he's able to continue on. Certainly is. Tyler moves to the bottom. He can't believe what just happened in front of him. Meanwhile... It is still, Emmerling still battling in that pack of cars. Ripkema right there with him with the number 32 car. And right behind that car is, of course, the Kyle Bonsignor machine. Little contact happening, starting to develop in that pack of cars just out of the top five. Boy, Patrick Emmerling has had some really entertaining saves in the NASCAR Xfinity Series qualifying several cars that he has seen out of shape he brings that back to the modifieds here at Thompson he had that car way out of shape in turns one and two was able to rope it back in even with contact from behind from Tyler Ripkema he is now starting to close back in though on the 46 of Craig Lutz and he's going back on the attack in turn one certainly is we're less than 25 circuits left in this event we've talked about it before we've seen late event cautions change the entire complexion of the event. We're back looking at Patrick Emmerling trying to get underneath the Lutz number 46. That would put Emmerling back into the top four. He's right there behind him, down the back straightaway. Watch down in turn number three. Again, looks to the outside for a moment, peeks to the bottom, slides the back end around, 
and he still can't get the job done. Doing everything he can to loosen that car up on the corner to be able to get underneath Craig Lutz, but Lutz has just been so wide with that 46. He's not giving Patrick Emerling a lot of options to work with. High again entry in turn three. He'll try the crossover again off turn number four, but he cannot keep the nose alongside on the straightaway. And that's working to the advantage of Ripka. Ripka closing in. Here comes Emerling. He took a peek at it again on the bottom. Could do it down into turn number three. It is still Lutz there. Ripped him up. Now, all of a sudden, off the turn again. Patrick Emerling is starting to loosen up, and that car is getting exceptionally loose. Now, look at Emerling trying to go to the outside. This is a battle for fourth, the 46 from Long Island, New York. Miller plays New York. Craig Lutz leading the way. Orchard Park, New York. Patrick Emerling into the back bumper. Mike Marshall, the rookie. They'll split him in the middle. Side by side now for fourth in turn one. Perhaps the biggest Timex timely move of the event is the number one car splitting the apple and coming out as car number one moves into the top four. Ripkema follows him through. Lutz gets bounced back to position number five. Daring moment that time by Patrick Emerling to go all the way to the bottom of the racetrack. He's inside the top four. Good news for him. Bad news, he's got a long way to go if he's going to catch Justin Bonsignor, who's almost three seconds ahead. We're down to the final 18 laps. Make it 17 to go when the race leader, Ron Silk, comes across the start-finish line this time by. He's been able to open up a 1.2-second advantage over Jake Johnson out front. He's starting to even string it out even more than that now. Jake Johnson settling in the second. If you watch and you're watching on flow, the margin between first and second and second and third is about the same. Nobody seems to be gaining or having anything extra there. Meanwhile, Kyle Bonsignor in the 22 car is trying to shake off Austin Beers. Beers is behind him. You're looking at him down the back straightaway here. Beers can reel him in. Now Beers is going to try to go to the outside. It just doesn't pay off. Eighth right now for Austin Beers. That's as high as he's been able to get here on this second run. Kyle Bonsignor, a seventh place finish. He's finished eighth twice already this season. Trying to better that here before we get to the check and flag in the final 15 laps for Kyle Bonsignor. Leader continues to come up on lap traffic. Ron Silk, margin between first and second, 1.485. Johnson in second. And it appears that that margin is starting to get even bigger for Ronnie Silk. Silk, that car firmly in command. Jake Johnson at one point in time, it closed within a half a second early on in this run, but he has not been able to match Ron Silk, who continues to drive away with it. The battle raging on again between the 22. Kyle Bonsignor and Austin Beers. Looks like these guys will fight for this seventh position right down to the checkered flag here in the Icebreaker 150 in what has been a pretty event-filled day. Lots of drama, lots of storylines as this one has played out, but the one thing that has remained consistent has been the strength and speed of Ronnie Silk in front. Certainly has. He has been the dominant car throughout the event. Here comes Austin trying to make the move again. It just doesn't happen. Bonsignor is still settling in. Now here comes Austin Beers. Got the car down low to the inside. Couldn't do it that time. Tries it again. Coming off the second turn down the back straightaway. Down the back stretch they come. Time starting to run out. It'll be 10 laps to go as Ron still comes across the line. The race getting long. 10 to go. And here is Beers again looking to the bottom. Can't quite make it work. Tries everything. Looks for some real estate that almost doesn't exist to the inside of the racetrack. Come up on lap traffic again. You're looking at Austin Beers. Gets it down low off the turn. But Bonsignor has enough giddy up off turn number four. Here comes Beers again, trying the inside groove. Not going to give up, but you can see Kyle Bonsignor's car really starting to skate out there on the racetrack as he tries to keep it underneath him. They played a little bit of a different pitch strategy, came down pit road twice, made adjustments early on, and that adjustment was able to put him inside the top ten. He drove from the back of the pack forward. A good run for Kyle Bonsignor, and the same could be said. Austin Beers, starting all the way to the back of the pack today, was able to charge forward. There you see on the left side of the screen, the battle now heating up as Patrick Emerling starts to put the heat 
on the 51 of Justin Bonsignor for third. Yes, just a few minutes ago. Remember what happened on the last initial start. It was Emerling who went up the hill in the racetrack. Now he has gained that position again. Patrick Emerling closing in on Justin Bonsignor as they come back to the stripe this time. Five laps to go. The high five for Ronnie Silk, who looks like he's back in winning form here at Thompson for the 50th anniversary event. Emerling trying again to get down underneath lap traffic just in front of him. Patrick Emerling in the one car tries to squeak to the inside, and he does. Monsignor is bumped back to position number four. So Patrick Emerling now up to third. He's got a long way to go if he's going to catch Jake Johnson, who rides all by himself in the second position. And Justin Bonsignor here giving up a position in the late going. Austin Beers able to get by the 22 car of Kyle Bonsignor. So Beers able to stretch out in front, move into seventh. Bonsignor now back to the eighth position. Up off turn number four, the race leader will be Ron Silk. He'll see three laps to go in what has been a dominating performance for the 16 car. No question. It's been flawless throughout the event. Phil Moran dialed the car into perfection as car number 16 is in a zone of its own. Great one for Jake Johnson, but Johnson had nothing left to close up that gap and the long green flag run for the final 50 will tell the story. We have seen drivers here at Thompson Speedway begin to dominate. At one point in time, it was Doug Kobe. More recently, it was Justin Bonsignor. Now it's starting to look like it could be Ronnie Silk. They come across the line this time, one to go. Final circuit in the competition. You're literally riding with Ronnie Silk as he comes off turn number two. 50 years of the icebreaker event. The chill is off. The heat is on. Ronnie Silk will win the 50th anniversary of the icebreaker from Thompson Speedway. Second time this season, he'll visit Victory Lane. 24th career victory for Ronnie Silk as he scores the win here today in the icebreaker 150. Jake Johnson across in second will run her up for the second consecutive race. Patrick Emerling rallied back to third. Justin Bonsignor, Tyler Ripkema, the top five. Good recovery there by Tyler Ripkema after being involved early on in the incident in turn one. Here is Ron Silk, though. What a day for him. A dominating performance. This team has not missed a beat since they won the championship a year ago. Certainly haven't. And, you know, we talk about the past in history. We have to look towards the future. Jake Johnson has a bright career ahead of him to finish in the runner-up spot. And what about Patrick Emerling? He did everything from recovering from two close calls to being the quickest car off pit road, and he still finishes on the podium in the LFR house car. Good run for all three of those drivers in a, a podium that is certainly going to be making up the storylines as the season goes on. Ron Silk, one of them. Of uh, Many said today that Jake Johnson is going to contend for the win. He certainly did that today with that runner-up finish. I know that team is going to be disappointed with a second-place effort because they knew that they had a hot rod today, but so did Ron Silk. And the speed there at the end of the race by Patrick Emerling was something. When we saw the green flag just past 50 laps to go, or just over 50 laps to go when we got that last restart after that caution flag, got shuffled out of line in turns one and two, and just really, once he got back to fifth, had a hard time working his way forward again and picking his way through traffic. You know, they talk about the importance of being consistent. Ronnie Silk was exactly that. He never used up his race car. He knowed when, he knew when to race at his best and his hardest. There he is in his car, about ready to get out. Familiar sight in victory lane, defending champion. And, of course, he's got a big smile on his face again. Phil Moran there to shake his hand. And Ronnie Silk, in just a few short moments, will be celebrating here at Thompson. Ladies and gentlemen, there is Silk out of the car. Let's go trackside. Here he is, your winner this afternoon at Thompson Speedway, Ron Silk. He's the defending series champion. One here back in the fall, and now he picks up another one at Thompson. Ron, when we talked before the race, you said you're always confident coming here, but it's going to be a victim of how these pit stops play. After you made it down pit road, at what point were you confident that you could be the winning car? 
Yeah, I was confident before the pit stop. Um, you know, I had driven to the lead there and, and was able to kind of drive away from everybody. Um, just a fantastic car from the start of the race to the beginning. Um, great pit stop by all the guys. These are the guys that make this happen and uh, just pumped to be back in victory lane. So coming off a championship, getting another win here, this is your second this season. Where's your confidence in heading into the rest of the season? It's pretty high. I mean, you know, Richmond was a nail-biter. We could have uh, could be looking at three in a row, but shoulda, coulda, woulda. So we'll go to the next one and, and try and get another one. Congratulations, Ron. Thank you. That's Ron Silk getting win number two of the season here at Thompson Speedway. Thanks, Jesse. The historic team down below, you see them all smiles. The team based out of Newtown, Connecticut, Ron Silk, just moved, bought a new house just a few miles from the race shop, and he'll be able to celebrate with the team here this week as they get ready for the next race on tour, which takes place in the great state of New Hampshire at the Monadnock Speedway early in the month of May. It certainly does, and remember, that's the first short track stop, brand new racing surface. Will we have a new player, or will we have one of the same? Stay tuned and be a part as the Wheel and Modified Tour goes to the high banks of Manadnock. Well, Jake Johnson had a really solid run here today. Contended for the victory, but he came up just short. Let's go trackside and hear from him. Your second place finisher here this afternoon, Jake Johnson. Jake, you finished second here back in the fall as well. What's going through your mind here taking the checker flag? Oh, we're just going to try to keep this, keep up to the 16. Uh, Two races in a row here at Thompson. We got the runner-up position, so I can't I can't be upset. We had an awesome pit stop the, and a great spot. Everyone's doing their job, and it's really showing the results. Um, i got to thank all the fans for coming out tonight and uh, appreciate what the tour does in Thompson so we can still be racing here. Anything more you could have done there at the end to try to catch Ron? I had nothing besides hanging out my tongue. I mean, <laughs> there's nothing left in the chamber, but you know, the 16 was just really good today. We're going to work on it and try to keep up to him. Thanks, Shay. Thank you of uh, Lightning McQueen hanging out your yes, tongue to get to the absolutely. finish. absolutely. He would have needed a uh, very long, long opportunity to be able to catch up with Ronnie Silk, who was so good. He's posing with that beautiful icebreaker trophy and the Ben Dodge drawn logo for this event on the face of that trophy as uh, he celebrates another victory. 24 win strong, 7th at this racetrack. Ron Silk uh, got his first one here several years ago. He celebrates another one here today. Jesse Punch. Patrick Emmerling finishing on the podium here after a hard battle today. Patrick, how do you describe your run this afternoon? Uh, we had, uh, you know, the whole Fleetworks team, um, you know, everyone involved here. I mean, we showed up with an excellent car uh, once again. And, um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, uh, first car out uh, on the pit stop. And um, we had the, um, you know, officially didn't catch it. I kind of feel like... Uh, Martin Truex the other day at Richmond, uh, he jumped the start, then ran us. He edged us to the, jumped the start, edged us to the line, and he took us way up the hill there. So, um, you know, I'm just going to maybe run him like that in the future. And uh, But, yeah, officiating, um, I thought would have caught that. But, um, but uh, you know, one of the things, yeah, the uh, you know, it happened the other day in the cup race too. And um, But, uh, you know, we had the car to beat today. We were the fastest car. It took us a little bit to get going, but we were the fastest car right at the end. And i got to just give it up to uh, everyone involved, uh, Rich, um, Dell, uh, Rob, LFR, the whole the whole crew here. I mean, everyone did an awesome job, and um, you know, fed, did everything right. I thought, but just got uh, you know beat by a jump start and got run up the hill. So, uh, but uh, we're coming. I mean, this is this is our third race in, and uh, we had awesome race cars every race, and um, just uh, fortunate to be here, and um, just uh, love this whole crew and um, everyone involved, and uh, we'll uh, get the next time. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. The thoughts of Patrick Everling, third place finish here today. Well, it's been a busy couple of weeks sure for the NASCAR has. Wheel and Modified Tour, but we will turn our attention about a month from now to the Monadnock Speedway for the third annual Granite State Derby. It'll take place on Saturday, May 4th. It's also the start of the Granite State Cup, $20,000 in posted award across the three Monadnock races here this season. The JDV Productions team putting on uh, quite a promotion again this year. Certainly are. Then it moves on to... Uh, the 15th of May to Riverhead Raceway, one of the great short track stops on the island, and then on to one of my favorite racetracks in June 1st, the Vendetti home that is better known as Seacock Speedway. 
June 22nd, a new date for the New Hampshire Motor Speedway NASCAR Cup Series weekend. The Saturday edition will feature the Wheel and Modify Tour, always a great event with high-speed drafting and usually makes the highlight reel at the end of the season. Uh, what a day it was here in Thompson. We saw that long green flag run in the midsection of the race, and there was no denying the 16th car today of Ronnie Silk. Very strong from the drop of the green flag. He scores the victory again, but it wasn't without some drama and carnage. It certainly wasn't. Heartbreakers during the early laps of the event. More cautions than we anticipated, but when things settled in, the final 50 was spectacular. The action was great here at Thompson. The intensity continues to build. Ron Silk, the winner. We'll see you in a couple of weeks at Manadnock Speedway when the Wheel and Modified Tour continues to roll on. This copyrighted telecast may not be transmitted or used in any form without the authorized written consent of NASCAR Broadcasting. NASCAR would like to thank all of our fans for your support, and we hope you enjoyed today's broadcast.